iron engineers in this video we're going to talk about pontine lesions so let's go ahead and get started iron engineers so in this video we're going to talk about pontine lesions so what we got to do is we're going to go through a bunch of different lesions okay we're going to go over first here ventral pontine syndrome okay also referred to as millard gubler syndrome now with this one what i want us to do is we're going to take here a cross section of the pons right and if you guys haven't already go watch our video on the neuroanatomy of the pons where we go over all the functions, all the structures with inside of the pons, what their names are, what they do, okay? If you guys already know that, great. We're gonna go ahead and uh, add on to that. So first thing with a ventral pontine syndrome, okay, or Miller-Gubler syndrome, is there's a lesion and it's obviously in the ventral aspect of the pons. Do you guys remember what this ventral structure of the pons is called? It's called the base of the pons or the basilar part of the bonds, pons. And do you guys remember the structures that were involved in it? The corticopontine nuclei, the cortico, I'm sorry, the, um, the pontine nuclei, the pontocerebellar fibers, and here your middle cerebellar peduncles, which connects your pons to the cerebellum, right? One thing we didn't mention in that neuroanatomy video though, and we're gonna add it in here, is you have these little blue dots. These blue dots will explain them a little bit more. These are your corticospinal, and your corticonuclear or corticobulbar fibers that are coming from the cortex going down to your spinal cord or to cranial nuclei in the medulla, okay? Now, ventral pontine syndrome is a lesion and look what it's involving. It's involving three primary structures. What are those structures? If you guys remember, what is this guy here? This is one of your actual cranial nerves. He wraps around this nerve and then comes out. What is that guy called? That's your facial nerve. So one of the lesions is actually, when this lesion happens, it takes out the facial nerve fasciculus. Okay, so these fibers of the facial nerve. If that happens, then that facial nerve on the left side is gonna supply the muscles of facial expression on the left side. So this will cause ipsilateral facial nerve palsy. Now, we're, we already covered all the different aspects of the facial nerve in an individual video on that, but to give you guys an overview, what does the facial nerve do? It supplies the muscles of facial expression. So if you take out the muscle of facial expression on that side, it's gonna cause drooping of this one side of the face. Since the lesion is on the left side, it'll cause drooping of the left side of the face. Okay, what else does it do? It also allows for lacrimation and salivation. So there'll be loss of lacrimation and salivation. But again, it plays a role in salivation and lacrimation and even a little bit of nasal gland secretions too. But if you take that out, you'll have ipsilateral, in this case, left-sided loss of lacrimation and le ipsilateral uh, loss of salivation. What else? It supplies the anterior two thirds of the tongue. But again, it's only gonna apply, su supply the left half of that anterior two thirds. So you'll have loss of taste in the left or ipsilateral anterior two thirds of the tongue, okay? So again, it plays a role with taste. And of what part? Anterior two thirds of the tongue. And again, not the biggest, most important thing, but it also plays a role with pain, temperature, touch sensations of the external ear and the tympanic membrane. So again, since it plays a role with touch, pain, and even some temperature sensations of, again, the ear, but particularly the external ear and the tympanic membrane. You'll have loss of touch, pain, temperature sensations coming from the external ear and what else? From the tympanic membrane, okay? So if there is a lesion involving this facial nerve fasciculus, you could have all this ipsilateral, same side of the lesion, facial nerve palsy. So let's write that one down here. So again, what do we have here? We have ipsilateral facial palsy. And we already can explain now how that will present. All right, so now that we covered the facial nerve, let's come back up and let's cover the next structure that's damaged. Okay, we covered the facial nerve. Now you have this blue nerve, this blue fasciculus. What's that blue fasciculus coming from? Let's follow it back. That's that nucleus. That's the abducens nucleus. So the abducens nerve, the fasciculus of cranial nerve six or the abducens nerve is damaged. Okay, cool. 
let's come down here to this structure here. We have an eyeball. Let's say here is going to be the nasal side of the eye. And here is going to be the ear side. Okay, so the, towards the temple. So medial lateral. Okay, if you guys remember, the abducens nerve supplies what muscle? The lateral rectus. How do you guys remember that? LR6, right? So if that's the case, then let's bring it over here. That would be lateral here, right? So there would be a muscle over here. Now, what does the lateral rectus do? When he contracts, he pulls this eyeball in which direction? Towards the ear, laterally, abducts it. But if you damage the abducens nerve that's supplying that lateral rectus on the ipsilateral side of the lesion, then the eyeball won't be able to move laterally. So now the medial rectus, who's on the other, supply by, other side, supplied by a completely different nerve. Right? So over here you have the medial rectus. He's supplied by the oculomotor nerve. He pulls the eyeball inward. If the oculomotor nerve is completely intact, it's going to pull the eye medially, right? We don't have the abducens nerve functioning now to pull the eye laterally. So now this, this medial rectus is unopposed. Which way will the eye naturally start to deviate? Medially, okay? So if you take out the function of the lateral rectus, the eyeball is going to start kind of deviating medially, okay? And what do we call this since it's ipsilateral? So in other words, the lateral rectus of the left eye that's supplied by the left abducens nerve will be damaged. This will cause ipsilateral rectus palsy, okay? So this will cause ipsilateral And we got to do this twice. Lateral rectus palsy, right? So there's going to be, again, what type of movement the eye will then move and what direction. It'll move towards the actual uh, direction of where the ocular, the medial rectus is pulling. So in other words, it won't be, be able, it'll have unopposed action of the medial rectus. The eye will deviate inwards, okay? So now we have ipsilateral facial palsy. We have this ipsilateral lateral rectus palsy due to damage of the abducens fasciculus. What's the last thing? Okay, remember, we have this structure here where the pontine nuclei are. And what's coming down? Let's explain. Here we have up here your cerebral cortex, right? And here's your upper motor neurons. So these are your upper motor neurons. These upper motor neurons will descend downwards, right? These are motor fibers. They'll come down. As they come down, what happens? Some of these fibers will move around these pontine nuclei, all right? And when they do that, they'll come back together and move down towards the medulla. And as they move towards the medulla at the level of the pyramids, they cross, right? And then they'll cross here and move down into the lateral white column, and then synapse on the cell bodies of the lower motor neurons in the anterior gray horn. And these will go out to your skeletal muscles. Okay, so these are your lower motor neurons. Now, if you guys remember, we talked about this in multiple videos, but some of these cortical fibers coming from the cortex to these pontine nuclei, some will actually synapse on those pontine nuclei. And then what some of those will do is they'll send these fibers to the contralateral cerebellum. And what do we call these fibers? These are your cortico ponto cerebellar fibers because they're fibers going from the cortex to the pontine nuclei to the contralateral cerebellum. These blue fibers, which we represented as these blue dots in this diagram, these ones that are continuing downwards after the pontine nuclei are two types of fibers. What types of fibers are these? corticonuclear and corticospinal, okay? Corticonuclear means that they're going to specific structures like the glossopharyngeal nerve or the vagus nerve or other cranial nerve nuclei that's located within the medulla or the pons, okay? It'll synapse on those and then stimulate those cranial nerves, okay? The corticospinal, they'll go down into the spinal cord and stimulate these lower motor neurons. Now, whenever there is this lesion, ventral pontine syndrome, it primarily takes out 
these corticospinal fibers. So let's track this down. Where's the lesion? The lesion we had was on this left side and it was right here. It's going to take out, let's follow these fibers from the upper motor neuron all the way down to the lower motor neuron. Moving here, moving here, crossing to the other side. It's gonna supply the muscles on the contralateral side. So those muscles are now going to be paralyzed. So that's called contralateral hemiplasia. Okay, let's write that down. So then we also will have contralateral hemiplasia. All right, we covered that, right? So this is your ventral pontine syndrome. How do we remember this triad? Ipsilateral facial palsy, ipsilateral really abducens nerve palsy, which will cause uh, paresis of the lateral rectus, and contralateral hemiplasia. That covers the ventral pontine syndrome. Now let's go into the next one here. All right, so we covered that now. Let's move into this next one, foveal syndrome. And actually some of the things that you'll see in foveal syndrome we've already covered in the ventral pontine or Miller-Gubler syndrome, okay? So let's look at this lesion. It's still involving the ventral aspect of the pons, but it's taking out a piece of this tegmental area too, and we'll talk about what that structure is and its significance in a second. But again, we should already know if it's damaging this purple fiber, which we already talked about before, what is that? That's the facial nerve. So if that's damaged, it's gonna cause what thing? Ipsilateral facial nerve palsy, right? It's also taking out the fasciculus of the abducens nerve. So what's that gonna cause? Ipsilateral what? Abducens nerve palsy or that lateral rectus palsy, right? Where the eye, the lateral rectus of that ipsilateral side won't be able to contract and the eye will deviate medially due to the unopposed activity of the medial rectus. And we're taking out some of these corticospinal fibers. You see those blue fibers in there? We're taking out some of those structures too. And remember, what did that do? That went to the contralateral lower motor neuron eventually, right? That caused contralateral hemiplasia. So three things that we already see here, we already saw in Miller-Gubler syndrome. Let's write those down. What are they? Again, we have ipsy, lateral, facial nerve palsy. We have ipsy, lateral, lateral rectus palsy, right? And that was because of the abducens nerve being damaged. And we have contralateral hemiplegia, all right? The last one here is the only thing that really helps to differentiate these two. If you see here, this mainly involved the basilar part of the pons, but it extends back a little bit into the tegmentum and it involves these pink nuclei structures. All right, so what we have to talk about here is there's this little pink structure there, right? That paramedian uh, pontine reticular formation. It's got one heck of a name here. So what do we have here? We got the paramedian pontine reticular formation, right? Uh, a lot of times you'll honestly see this in shorthand as <laughs> what I would rather write it as, but PPRF, right? So paramedium pontine reticular formation. These are important because they play a role with um, what's called your corrective saccades. We're gonna make it kind of, we're gonna break it down really simply. But what happens is, for example, let's say you turn your head to the right. When you turn your head to the right naturally through your vestibular ocular reflex, your eyes will beat to the left, okay? So when you turn your head to the right, your eyes will beat to the left. What happens is that your paramedian pontine reticular formation or your front and your frontal eye fields, okay, kind of conjugated together, will send information to these cranial nerve nuclei, six, four, and three, really, via that medial longitudinal fasciculus, and tell them to then move in the direction that you're moving your head. So again, you'll turn your head to the right, your eyes will quick beat to the left, your paramedian pontine reticular formation will help them to go in the direction that you're turning your head right after. So it goes boom, and then boom. So, what happens here is if you damp, so what does the paramedium pontine reticular formation do? In a simplest way, really, is it kind of just tells this six nerve nucleus, okay, go ahead, and, go ahead and work. Go ahead and send your signals. So what this guy will do is this six nerve, what does he do? He goes out to your lateral rectus on that same side. So he'll go to this lateral rectus here on the left. This is your left eye, this is your right eye. Tells the lateral rectus to contract, 
okay, which will pull your eye laterally. It'll help to move it in this direction. Then, if that's stimulated, here we'll put a little stimulatory sim symbol there. If that's stimulated, then what's going to happen? He'll send that signal there, and he'll also move over to the contralateral side, right? So he'll move over here and stimulate that third nerve via the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Same thing, if we were to do it here on the right side, it would go to this lateral rectus, and it would go over here to the contralateral third nerve and stimulate that. Let's just focus on this left side here. If this abducens nerve is stimulated, he'll stimulate the left lateral rectus, move over through this contralateral, or in this case, the right medial longitudinal fasciculus to the right third nerve nucleus. This right third nerve nucleus will then go to your right medial rectus. And what is the medial rectus gonna do? It's gonna cause adduction or medial rotation, moving the eyeball in this direction. You see how they're both going the same direction there? So if you have a lesion here, you damage what we said here, that paramedian pontine reticular formation. You don't have any stimulation to this abducens nerve now. Now, if that's the case, there's no stimulation to this left lateral rectus. He is going to be inhibited. So whenever you're trying to turn your gaze or move your eyes in that direction, in this case, towards the left, it won't be able to do that. So you won't be able to move towards that, move your gaze towards the left side for this a a situation here, right? So this abducens nerve is inhibited. Then, again, from the abducens nerve, contralateral, right, through the right medial longitudinal fasciculus, he's gonna stimulate that third nerve nucleus. But because you damage that paramedian pontine reticular formation, you don't have a positor positive signal to this, less positive signals is gonna lead to less stimulation to this right third nerve nucleus. If this right third nerve nucleus is inhibited, he is not going to stimulate your medial rectus to contract on the right side. So now the medial rectus on the right side won't move the eye medially or towards the left. This will be inhibited. So your gaze will be inhibited on the same side as the lesion has occurred. So we call this an ipsilateral gaze palsy. Does that make sense? So again, you damage the, the lesion that you have is gonna cause the gaze towards the same side of that lesion, lesion to be inhibited. So again, what do we call this? An ipsilateral gaze palsy. All right, sweet deal. So that covers foveal syndrome. All right, so now we gotta go into the next one, ventromedial pontine syndrome or Raymond syndrome. Okay, so again, this lesion, it's gonna be pretty simple because we've already talked about these. This is a very simple one, thankfully. Again, look where the lesion is. It's involving primarily the ventral part of the pons. And it's taking out only two structures in this situation here. It's taking out this purple nerve. What was that purple nerve again? That was the facial nerve, right? So the facial fasciculus. So there's gonna be an ipsilateral facial nerve palsy. Pretty simple. What else are we taking out? Again, we're primarily focusing on those blue fibers that are going down. That's gonna take out your corticospinal fibers, okay? So the ipsilateral corticospinal, fi well, the corticospinal fibers that are coming down that'll go to the contralateral side, those will also be damaged. So you'll have contralateral hemiplasia. So again, what do we have here? Ipsilateral facial nerve palsy. And again, since these fibers from the corticospinal tract will cross over, contralateral hemiplasia. So that's pretty simple, right? So we can write these down. So again, what do we have here? Ipsi lateral facial nerve palsy and what else do we have we have contralateral hemiplasia okay i just want to take a quick second here because we haven't had a chance to discuss it just yet but we can do it now a little bit about the blood supply the reason why i want to cover this really quickly is because sometimes these will come up on exams okay and it's also important to know, if you guys remember, we did a video on the circle of Willis, and we're just gonna kind of briefly only go through a couple of those vessels. If you guys remember coming up on the sides here of the spinal cord through those transverse foramina within a cervical vertebrae, you had your vertebral arteries, right? Then what happens is your vertebral arteries will eventually come together, and whenever they come together, they make the basilar artery, right? The basilar artery will then move its way upwards and eventually, once it gets kind of towards the top of the midbrain, it'll give off a branch here, right? 
And if you guys, so again, what do we have here? I'm just gonna annotate them, vertebral arteries. Then here you're gonna have the basilar artery. And then here at the top, at the level of the midbrain really, you're gonna have the posterior cerebral arteries. Well, we gotta worry about the vessels primarily for the pons. Cause again, you guys know that there is a couple other structures here. You have your superior cerebellar arteries, right? And then we have another one here. If you guys really wanna remember, you have your pica, so your posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. Then you have your anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, right? So again, you have your pica and ica. Well, if we look here, the primary vessels that are supplying the pons is mainly the basilar artery because the basilar artery gives off these little pontine uh, perforating arteries off the basilar artery. But also, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery also gives a little bit of supply to the pons as well. So, easy way to remember it is to look at a cross section here, really. Okay? Now, the cross section here, if we have here the pons, right? And here's going to be the dorsal aspect here, right? So here's our dorsal aspect, and here's our ventral aspect. Here, from all the way from the ventral aspect, more towards the medial aspect of this pons, from this portion here all the way to this portion here, so ventral to dorsal, more medial. This whole thing is primarily supplied by the basilar artery, but particularly a branch called the paramedian branches of basilar artery, okay? So if there is usually an occlusion of these vessels, it's gonna cause damage to this portion of the pons. Now if we go to this other one here, here's this brown marker here, you have some other vessels here. So you see right here this brown portion, this is also little branches coming off of the basilar artery. But you know what these branches are called? These are called your short circumferential, I'm just gonna put circum, uh, branches of your basilar artery, okay? And the last one here is actually kind of a combo, believe it or not. This is, we're gonna kind of shorten this one down here but this outer lateral portion, so pretty much the lateral portion of the pons, is supplied by two vessels. This was the short circumferential branches of the uh, basilar artery. The green one gives off small, what's called long circumferential. So again, long circumferential, we're just gonna do that, branches of the basilar artery. And guess what else is supplying this portion here? Branches of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So again, what vessels primarily supplying the pons? The basilar artery, okay? But what supplies more of that lateral portion of the pons is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery branches, okay? So again, it's important to remember this blood supply because this commonly comes up as questions um, on certain exams, okay? So now that we've covered this one, Let's move on to the next pontine lesion. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about lateral pontine syndrome, or Marie Faux syndrome, right? So it's a kind of an interesting name there, but again, easier way to remember this, it's, act, it's actually causing lesions more to the lateral aspect of the pons. So you have here medial, and again here you have more lateral aspect, okay? So this lateral pontine syndrome is gonna involve pretty much two structures. And again, one of them we've already covered, See where the lesion is? Look what it's involving here. It's involving this kind of ascending tract, and we'll talk about what that is, but it's also involving those blue dots. And again, what were those blue dots representing? Corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers, okay? So it's going to inhibit what? It's gonna inhibit those corticospinal fibers that are coming down, crossing at the medulla, and going down to the contralateral lower motor neuron, leading to contralateral hemiplasia. So again, what will be one of the presentations that we already know, we don't have to go into great detail about, one of the lesions here is contralateral hemiplasia, okay? So if we look here, we have contralateral hemiplasia. All right, sweet. 
So that covers that aspect. That's an easy one. Now we have to cover another thing here. Uh, you see how this is damaging this kind of red structure here? What is that red structure there? You know what that's called? It's called the spinal lemniscus. Now, the spinal lemniscus, if you guys remember, we already talked about this in multiple videos. Might as well do it again though, right? This is carrying pain, temperature. So what is it carrying? It's carrying pain. It's carrying temperature. It's carrying crude touch and even a little bit of pressure sensations. And again, it's coming through two tracks, right? If we were to say particularly the pain and temperature pathway, that's getting carried through what's called the lateral spinal thalamic tract. The crude touch and pressure is primarily being carried through the ventral spinal thalamic tract. But both of these eventually fuse together and become the spinal lemniscus. So these guys will come here into your dorsal gray horn, synapse on these, uh, uh, these neurons here within the dorsal, uh, dorsal horn, cross over. And again, if it's pain temperature sensations, it'll go to the lateral white column and ascend. If it's crude touch and pressure sensations, those fibers will go to the ventral white column and ascend. But eventually, they will fuse together along with other fibers like the, uh, spi the spinotectal fibers and spinal mesencephalics. There's a bunch of different fibers, spinal reticular fibers, a bunch of those. But the main ones is lateral spinal thalamic and the ventral spinal thalamic tract. And again, these pain pathway will come all the way up and eventually it'll synapse at the thalamus and then go to your cerebral cortex. So again, eventually it'll come here to your thalamus. But again, this is called your spinal lemniscus. So if we had a lesion here, in this case, let's just, for example, just pretend, I know it's here on the left, but pretend the lesion is over here on the right side, just for this diagram's sake here. The lesion we have damaged here. Follow this pain, temperature, crude touch and pressure pathway back down. Goes here, goes here, and goes to the contralateral side. So if the lesion is on the right side, the pain, temperature, crew touch, and pressure sensations are gonna be lost on the contralateral side, okay? So again, you'll have what other kind of symptom or clinical manifestation here? You'll have contralateral loss of pain, temperature, crude touch, and what else? Pressure sensations, right? There's actually one more structure that we have to cover here. And if you guys remember what is this structure here. All right, so the last thing I wanna mention here again for these lesions is we already talked about how it can involve a little bit of these corticospinal fibers, okay? Another one that it can involve is again, this spinal lemniscus. And another aspect of this lesion, if we were to extend it out a little bit more too, is it can take out a teensy bit of the middle cerebellar peduncles. So again, what else could we have damaged here? We could also have some damage to the middle cerebellar peduncles. Now again, what is the middle cerebellar peduncles connecting? They're connecting the pons to the cerebellum. So if this lesion is occurring here on this left middle cerebellar peduncle in this situation on this diagram, it's gonna cause the connection to the left cerebellum to be affected, right? So this is gonna to lead to, what is the responsibility of the cerebellum? It's important for coordination, for posture, for muscle tone, for even helping with equilibrium. So if you take out, if you damage this structure going to the left cerebellum, what's it gonna cause? It's gonna cause ataxia, right? And that is gonna be on the same side. Since it's the left middle cerebellar peduncle, it's gonna be going to the left cerebellum. So the left cerebellum is gonna be affected here. And this is gonna cause ipsilateral ataxia. So again, what is another presentation for these? This is ipsilateral ataxia. Okay, and if we wanna be really specific, cerebellar ataxia. Okay. So again, that covers these main, the main presentation of lateral pontine syndrome. It is important to remember though, 
that sometimes this lesion can even extend more dorsally. So if in certain textbooks you read that this lesion goes a little bit more dorsally, what else could it potentially involve? It could involve the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal system, and it could also take out the cochlear nuclei. So that could lead to deafness, and it could also cause loss of, loss of pain, temperature, and even a little bit of proprioceptive information from the face. So again, if this does extend farther back, it can involve more of these dorsal structures. But the main ones that I have within the book that we read and we'll have down in the description box involves these three things. All right, so the last one that I wanna talk about here is locked-in syndrome. Now this one is a terrible condition. It, it honestly is very, very depressing and sad to talk about, but it is important that we understand it. Um, so locked-in syndrome is basically um, a bilateral pontine lesion. Okay, primarily affecting the ventral aspect, but it can actually affect the six nerve nucleus as well. So, big thing that I want you to remember for this one, okay, is going back to this. So if it involves this structure here, okay, where pretty much all your corticospinal and those corticonuclear fibers are coming down through, what's that going to cause? Okay, if you guys remember, let's go back to this diagram here. Here's gonna be our upper motor neurons. These guys are gonna come down. They're gonna kinda of disperse throughout the pontine nuclei. Some of them will move down into the, eventually it will go into the medulla at the level of the pyramids and do what? Eventually they will cross, move into the lateral white column, same thing, disperse, come together, cross at the pyramids of the medulla, lateral white column, and synapse, on these lower motor neurons. That'll go to your muscles, okay? So these are your lower motor neurons and these are your upper motor neurons. The other thing that can happen is as some of these fibers are going down, some of these can stimulate certain cranial nerve nuclei as they're going downwards. Maybe in this case, the glossopharyngeal nerve, maybe the vagus nerve, right? So if you guys really want to, we can even put here the eighth nerve and the ninth nerve. I'm sorry, ninth and 10th nerve. So again, glossopharyngeal nerve is the ninth nerve and the vagus nerve is the 10th nerve. But if they're stimulating these structures, then what happens is the, the vagus and the glossopharyngeal nerve will go to their specific structures as well. Now, here's what I want you to remember. The lesion was on what side? In this case, it's on both sides. So we're gonna damage this here and damage this here. If you see this, it doesn't matter if we follow anything from this point down is damaged on both sides. So what happens is, is if you follow this guy down, these corticospinal fibers all the way down here, you're losing the contralateral side, okay? And if you damage these, you're losing this contralateral side. So this means you have bilateral loss of muscle control or bilateral paralysis from that point down. But guess what? These lower motor neurons are going to the upper extremities and the lower extremities. Again, so this will go to the upper extremities and to the lower extremities. So if you damage both bilateral corticospinal tracts going to the upper extremities and lower extremities, what is that gonna cause? Quadriplegia, okay? So you're gonna lose, you're gonna have paralysis of the entire body, okay? Bilateral side, so bilateral, upper extremity, lower extremity, trunk, everything is gonna be taken out. And that's gonna present with quadriplegia. So this will present with quadriplegia. Okay, the next thing, and here's what's again really sad. So they are, they're quadriplegic, so they don't have any function of the upper extremity, lower extremities, and you also are taking out the ninth and the tenth nerve. You know the ninth and the tenth nerve are actually important because they go to a bunch of different structures around your larynx and, and basically help with speech production, okay? So if you take out the ninth and the tenth nerve, all right, because these corticonuclear fibers are also damaged, not just the corticospinal, but the corticonuclear fibers are also damaged, guess what that's gonna cause? Loss of speech. Because again, the ninth and the tenth nerve also play a role in speech production, okay? So they play a role in speech production. 
And if you damage these because your corticonuclear fibers are taken out, what's going to happen if you lose your speech production? It's called aphonia. So they can't speak. So not only are they quadriplegic, but they also have aphonia. It's terrible. Okay. So we have quadriplegia, we have aphonia. The next thing that you have to remember here is it also takes out that abducens nerve nucleus. So you see here we have the abducens nerve, okay? It takes out the abducens nucleus. So if you guys remember, what does the abducens nucleus do? Where the heck is that blue marker? Oh, I have it. So here's the abducens nucleus here. The abducens nucleus, if you guys remember, will obviously go and go to the lateral rectus on the same side, right? So lateral rectus here on the right side, lateral rectus here on the left side. But also, we'll supply the contralateral third and fourth nerve via the medial longitudinal fasciculus. If you damage both of these, now look what happens. I'm gonna damage these abducens nuclei. I can't move the lateral rectus on either side. So lateral rectus on both sides are damaged. So I can't move my eyes, I can't abduct them, okay? I also damage primarily the third nerve nucleus as well. If I lose the activity of the oculomotor nerve, what does the oculomotor nerve go to? A ton of different muscles, okay? But the main one that I wanna focus on here is the medial rectus. If you inhibit this, now the medial rectus of both eyes won't be able to contract. So now your eyes won't be able to move medially. So you lose the horizontal movement. There's a horizontal gaze palsy. And again, moving left to right. That's a terrible thing, right? And on top of that, you now have no connection between the six nerve nucleus to all these guys via this medial longitudinal fasciculus. So technically, the medial longitudinal fasciculus is null at this point. You know what they call it whenever you have damage to the medial longitudinal fasciculus, what that leads to? It leads to internuclear ophthalmoplasia. But guess what? Both abducens nuclei are damaged. So this is bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplasia with horizontal gaze palsy. Okay, so let's write that down. So again, they have bilateral inter, I'm gonna put internuclear ophthalmoplasia with horizontal gaze palsy. And believe it or not, the vertical gaze center or the vertical movements are actually somewhat intact just because of their position within the pons, okay? So again, the vertical gaze is actually somewhat intact, but their horizontal gaze is lost. So they have quadriplegia, aphonia, bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplasia with horizontal gaze palsy. The only thing that actually they, they do have is this doesn't take out the reticular formation, okay? So if you guys remember, what does the reticular formation do? A simple diagram here. Here's your reticular formation, right? It extends pr pretty much throughout the entire aspect of the brainstem. If you have any stimulus, whatever the stimulus is, whether it be touch st stimulus, whether it be a visual stimulus, whether it be an auditory stimulus, all of those things go to your reticular formation. He sifts through that and then sends that information to your cerebral cortex to alert you, to arouse you, to let you know of all of these sensations. This is actually intact. It's, it's fine in someone who has locked in syndrome. So in other words, they can hear you. If you open up their eyes, they can see you. They can feel all the sensations and they're aware of everything and conscious, but they can't move, they can't talk. Okay, so it's a terrible condition. So again, one of the things to remember here is that the reticular formation is intact. So they are conscious. All right, engineers, so in this video, we covered the pontine lesions. 
I hope all of them made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. If you guys did, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. I know that you guys always ask me the references that I use for some of these videos. I'm going to put down the references uh, down in the description box that we use for these lesions. Guys, if you guys did like this video, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, subscribe. Seriously, subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, our Instagram, our Patreon account. If you guys want to go ahead and join that, we would truly appreciate it. And guys, we love to hear from you. We love all the messages, all the kind words. And again, as always, Ninja Nerds, until next time.